Hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Open Analysis Live. So before we begin, just one follow-up on one of the comments that I saw. Uh, someone asked us to introduce ourselves at the beginning of the videos. So my name's Sergey. I'm the uh, shiny bald head in glasses, and Sean is the guy that has hair and a beard. So that's how you can kind of tell us apart. Both of us are, are the two halves of Open Analysis. One other comment uh, or follow-up on the comments that I wanted to address is in a previous video, I mentioned that maybe we put together a workshop dealing with API hosts and how to build like a sandbox with API hooks. So uh, we are going to do that. It looks like there's enough of you wanted that. So look forward to that. It probably won't be soon, but I guess stay tuned if you're interested. So today we're going to talk about just quickly unpacking a sample. It's just going to be a quick un unpacker tutorial. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you a, a quick little trick that you can use that might work and it might save you a lot of time. So basically, let's take a look at our sample first and, and then we'll talk about the trick. So right here, we have a sample that I pulled off malware traffic analysis. Awesome work from Brad. If you want samples to go in, practice your skills, um, I'll link his site in the description below. It's where I get a lot of samples and it's awesome work over there. So uh, this sample is a kind of uh, unknown crypto miner. Looking at the code after I unpacked it and took a look at it, it looks like a pretty straightforward script kitty type thing, but it's a, an excellent example of, of this unpacking technique that I wanna show you guys. So if we take a look at the uh, process tree Tree down here, we can see here's our original sample, and then it runs a copy of itself. And generally, when we see that, we think process injection, right? I covered this in another video, but anytime you see a process that starts a copy of itself, generally that means that they're going to try and inject code into the second process. But that's actually not the trick that I want to cover today. So uh, it's even easier than trying to identify how the code is injected into the second process. You can actually circumvent that completely and dump the code earlier. And this happens if the Packer is built using one of two Windows APIs. So if they use RTL decompressed buffer or if they use crypt decrypt. So these are uh, decompression and compression or encryption and decryption uh, Windows APIs. So most of the time, Packers will implement their own crypto algorithm or they'll use a third party library for compression and encryption. Sometimes you'll get lucky though and they'll use the Windows APIs for encryption and uh, decompression compression. So in this case, they're actually doing that. And so why don't we take a quick look at crypt decrypt. So it's, it's just a simple function where you pass in like the key and the buffer and the length of the buffer and then they'll decrypt the buffer for you and they return the decrypted information in the same buffer. So it's actually really easy to hook this uh, and dump it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, run the sample in a debugger. We're going to set a hook on crypt decrypt and I'll show you uh, I'll show you what I mean. Now uh, one of the important things here is how did I know that they're using crypt decrypt? Well what I usually do is if I'm if I have to use a debugger to um, extract a sample, if, if I have to use a debugger to unpack a sample, I'll always hook crypt decrypt and I'll always hook RTL decompress buffer because there's just a chance that maybe one of those will be hit um, before the other API calls that I have. So uh, in this case, I'm not going to show you, I already did that. Uh, I'm not going to show you what I was doing originally, uh, which was looking for process injection, but I just set these hooks just, it's kind of second nature to me to set, to set hooks on these two APIs um, just in case they're hit. And like I said, sometimes you get lucky and the packer will actually use one of these APIs. And if you do, it means you can pretty much stop unpacking. Basically, the reason why is because if, they're, if they've encrypted the binary, um, so it's an encrypted blob inside their PE file and they run crypt decrypt on it, well, the buffer after crypt decrypt is going to contain the uh, the decrypted binary, right? It's going to contain the decrypted payload. So you can just set a hook on it, check out the return buffer, and then, you know, you should have a BE file there. So, uh, so that's actually what I'm going to show you guys how to do here. So let's pop over to IDA. Uh, we have the binary loaded up already. I've called it coinminer.exe because I know it's a coin miner, um, but you know, it originally had a different name. So uh, here, if we want to just double check that this is packed, um, we can see first we look at our strings window here and we can see there are some strings, but not the ones that we would expect for a crypto miner. And then more telling than that is the fact that we only have a very small part of the binary that's been analyzed. So this blue means that it's actual code that, that Ida is analyzed and all the rest of it is unknown data or unanalyzed data. So it's very rare to see a PE file that has only a tiny bit of code in it and a whole bunch of data unless it's a packed file. So anytime you see this like huge ratio of unknown or uh, un not code data to code data, it's almost certainly a packed file. 
So um, this is the standard trick that I usually use um, where I'll set a uh, breakpoint on the, uh, I'll set a breakpoint on start and I'll use two VMs. So I have currently the VM with Ida in it and then I have a second VM here I can show you in a second. So here's my second VM, which is just a Windows XP VM where I will start the Ida uh, remote debugger. So here's the IP address that we're listening on. So if we go back to the, um, to the IDA instance, we can set up a remote Windows debugger, and then we can set up, in under debugger, we can set up the uh, IP address of the remote de debugger under host name. So it was uh, 131, okay? So you'll notice that I haven't set any hooks yet. I haven't set any uh, breakpoints on any APIs. I've just set one breakpoint on start. And the reason for this is because I like to run until the start of the malware before I start setting breakpoints, because otherwise they're gonna get hit, maybe during uh, loading of other libraries and stuff like that. So uh, let's run until we get to the start. Um, I always like to view the advanced toolbar uh, even when I'm debugging. So I turn that on and I wanna see the full stack view. I don't really care too much about the output window. Just trying to make this look a little bit prettier so I can uh, see what's going on here. And I wanna see the modules. So we've, uh, we've stopped on the breakpoint here at the start of our malware. If we go back to crypt decrypt here for a second and we find out what DLL is that contained in. So if we scroll down to the bottom of the documentation in MSDN, we should see here it's uh, ADV API 32. So here's the DLL that it's contained in. So if we pop back over to IDA, we can look for uh, ADV API 32 and then uh, control F and we'll find crypt or decrypt. There we go, we pull it up and then we can just set a uh, breakpoint on the start here, add a breakpoint. And then we'll run the binary until we get to that breakpoint. So it's doing its thing. Oh, and there we go, we've popped over and we've hit our breakpoint. So now it's kind of the interesting part here. So we need to go back to the definition of crypt decrypt in MSDN and we need to see what the arguments are that are passed to it. So let's scroll up here. So what we really care about is this data buffer and the length of the data. So these are, so this is on uh, argument one, two, three, four, five. Argument five is data and argument six is length. So let's go back to our IDA instance. Uh, here is a view of our stack. So remember the first thing pushed on the stack is a return address. So the arguments start one below it. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So this must be the buffer that's being passed in. So let's copy that and we'll open a new window here and uh, we'll jump to it using g go to that address. So here's the buffer um, that's being passed in to crypt decrypt. And I like to save the, um, I like to save the length of the buffer as well, just so that uh, if I have to dump the buffer out, I'll know the length of it. So the buffer was the next argument down on the stack here. So we can just copy this and uh, we can open another, uh, another window here, go to that address, DDD. Okay, so it looks like that's the size and we'll just save that for later. I'll just copy and paste that address over in here. And the, and the buffer starts at 72000. And that's also in hex. Okay, so we'll pop back over to our uh, IDA here. Um, and what we can do uh, now that we know where the buffer is and the size of it, um, we can actually just use the run until return so that we, we return, basically we run until we return from crypt to crypt and then we can take a look at the buffer. So there we go, we return from it. So let's take a look at our buffer here. Hey, look at that, we have the nice MZ header. So that's how fast it is. Literally it was like, you know, less than a minute to uh, unpack this. And now all we have to do is dump out that buffer. So here's a kind of interesting trick that I like to use. Um, I have a, a very small, very short um, IDA script that I use just to dump out buffers. And I'll also link that, uh, I'll link the gist uh, below in the description. So I'm just gonna load that script up here, script file and uh, mdump.py. So now that our script is loaded, we can just use the help function here um, in the console, so help. Uh, for memdump and we can see what the arguments are. So the first thing that we need is we need the address of the buffer, then we need the size of the buffer, and then we need the file that we're gonna write the dump out to. So uh, luckily we already copied those um, from and we stored them in uh, Sublime here. So all we have to do is we just have to copy the size and the buffer over um, and call memdump 
and send it out to a file. So pretty straightforward. Memdump and then the uh, buffer is here and the size is here. And then we have the file. So on my VM, I've mapped the temp drive of my host to the Z drive on the VM and I have a folder called work. So I'm gonna store stuff there. So I'm gonna do Z temp work and let's call it dump.bin. There we go, memdom success. So now that we've dumped it out, uh, let's open it up in Ida and uh, see what we've got. Okay, so we've opened up dump.bin in Ida and the first thing I wanna do is just check the strings here and see what we've got. Yeah, and so here we go. We can see the uh, strings that were passed to one of the binaries that we saw in hybrid analysis. So we know that we've actually unpacked the sample. So there we go, uh, super quick trick if you're trying to unpack stuff, always hook uh, crypt to crypt and RTLD compressed buffer. It's always worthwhile just in case you hit one of those while you're uh, doing your debugging because then you can check the output from them and see if maybe you got a PE file and uh, it's just a quick way to circumvent the entire packer basically. So hopefully you enjoyed that uh, nice short unpacker. Keep on leaving us comments below. Let us know what you'd like to see next. Uh, we're definitely taking in the ideas. It's, it's way more helpful to have stuff on YouTube uh, now that you guys can comment directly and let us know what you want to see. And as always, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious.